Good morning and welcome to Spokane Northview Church. And we are pleased that you have joined us this morning. Um, our service this morning is only streamed. And uh, <clears throat> our pastor will be preaching this morning. He's going to be starting a new series. And we're just happy that you have joined with us today. A few announcements that we do have. Uh, this is a new year, so we have new people that will be doing some of the offices in our church, and um, they'll be looking for some new things this year, and we're happy for that. We also have this, uh, this coming up this week is uh, 10 days of prayer. This will be a new thing. You will hear more about this um, in, uh, in an email that's coming that shows the links that we're going to be using this time. And uh, we hope that you will join in to the 10 days of prayer. This week, prayer meeting will be online on Zoom. We want you to join in. And uh, that will be Tuesday night at 630. So please uh, put that on your calendar and join with us. Some of you have, remember uh, Dustin Peslin. He was here to run a series for us online, and he has just completed uh, a new uh, short, powerful message that you'll want to hear, uh, The Armor of God. It's his latest uh, video, a short, powerful message, how to have total victory in the last days, how to equip yourself with the armor of God to be, uh, to be prepared for what's coming. So this is a good series and we just uh, hope that you can uh, join online and uh, the, the streaming on YouTube, Dustin Peslin. You know, this is being a new year, we look for some wisdom for a new year. And in Matthew 6, I have looked there, Matthew 6, towards the end. It talks here about seek. Seek. And that is to aim at, to strive after. Seek first. Seek first his kingdom. It's a priority. Should not be money, material treasures, and prosperity. Seek his kingdom. And number two, his righteousness. His way of doing and being right, which can also be translated justice. So as a new year, something to look at as we start this first Sabbath of a new year is to tune in and seek his kingdom and his righteousness. We'd like to have you join us now uh, as we kneel to have the first stanza of, of hymn number 671 as we come to you in prayer. Let us kneel. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can worship you this Sabbath day, beginning this new year uh, together, and we are looking to you. We want you to do a very special work inside of us this year. We ask that you draw close this Sabbath, that there would be nothing in our hearts that would stand in the way of receiving the blessing that heaven wants to give us, and that we might stand together to press on to the mission the Northview Church that you've given us, and that our hearts would be converted 
and that we would be on the road with you where you want to take us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, sing together. So if you have a phone at home or a hymnal, it's 545. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. And I invite you to join in singing this hymn together. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us, 545. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us, much we need thy tenderest care. In thy blessed pastures, feed us, for our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast brought us thy Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, as God us We are thine who have befriend us in the garden of our way. Keep thy flock from sin befriend us. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we Thou hast mercy to deliver us, and how to flee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, we will early turn to thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, we will early turn to thee. It's that special time when we worship the Lord in our giving. And I want to have a thank you for our members here at Northview. This last year, you have been faithful stewards. And we look as this new year comes, we have a new budget that we will be filling. It costs a little more to have the lights on and this type of thing. Our offering today is, is for our church budget. And, you know, there are several things in our conference from week to week that we give to. And I just like to look at them so that you can plan ahead and not give God what's left over. This morning here, as I look, you know, tithe 10%. That's an automatic. That's giving to God what he owns. And then we have a local church budget. In the local church budget, we usually look at 3 to 5% in giving. Uh, we do have the conference advance. And this is we, we look at 1 or 2%. And this goes to our education facilities, evangelism, vacation Bible schools, summer camps, uh, union magazine. There's a number of things in that packet right there. And then the fourth giving thing is the world budget. And it's been uh, asked that maybe we do 1% to 3%. So these are things to look at over the year as we uh, uh, plan to give God and not be like Malachi who has said, you know, do we rob God of tithes and offerings? So this morning we just want to reiterate a thank you for your um, 
giving this last year in our budget and this year as we plan a new year, we just ask that the Lord be with you and let's bow our heads at this time. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for the blessings that you continually give. Week to week, Lord, you are so faithful. And as we look at this new year, we want to be faithful too. So as we plan our giving for the year to fill the needs here and abroad, we just ask for your presence and we give you the glory, Lord, in this, in your name. Amen. My wife, Ruthie, has a children's story this morning, so I invite you to listen in. Well, hello. I have a children's story about mothers today. Now, when I was younger, as in about four years, five years ago, <laughs> I, um, my mom came to visit us, and this was when we were in Michigan. And she came to visit us, and she was helping me in so many different ways. And I really, really appreciated all that she did to help. And while well, I, one night, while I was sleeping, I suddenly woke up. And my stomach was hurting so bad, I didn't want to move. And I didn't know why it was hurting, and I was just absolutely miserable. And I thought, I am 20-something years old, and I should be able to take care of this myself. But guess who was there? My mom was there. And I thought to myself, oh, man, it would be so nice to have my mom help me right now because my tummy is really hurting. And I thought, well, I don't want to wake her up. So maybe I'll just, mm, I'll see if I can fix it on my own. And oh, I, I was feeling like I was going to throw up. I was not feeling good. And I'd eaten something that was really not good. And I was like, oh man, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. But I thought, well, maybe if I make a little bit of noise, just, just quiet noise. So I just like, oh, oh. And, and then I started making a little more noise. And I don't really want to wake her up, but kind of wanted to like see if she was awake. Cause it was she usually wakes up about four or five, and it actually was close to that time. I thought, well, maybe she's awake. Oh, oh, pretty soon I heard my mom knocking on the bathroom door. Are you okay in there? Oh, no, my stomach really hurts. I ate something really bad or something. I don't know, but I don't feel good at all. And my mom came, and she said, oh, I'll take care of you. And she got me some charcoal and she got me some things to help me feel better. And I thought, oh, thank you, mom. I really appreciate you, mom. And you know what? I could have taken care of myself and I probably should have been careful not to wake my mom up, but she was, she was already awake. Thankfully, I did ask her, she was awake. And she was willing to come in the middle, almost the middle of the night to come and help me. And I thought, you know what? I really appreciated that. But that's what Jesus does. You know, Jesus listens to us all the time of the day and night. We can come to him at any time of night and any time of the day, and he will come right there and help us. And he says, I'm here. What do you need? And we can ask him for help, just like I was able to ask my mom. She's told me many times, if you are in danger, if anything's going on, you can call me any time of night, any time of day. I'll answer the phone. And Jesus is the same way. You don't have to call him on a phone. You can pray and say, Jesus, help me. I need help right now. And he will say, I'll help you. And I will help you in the best way possible. So let's ask Jesus to help us, to ask him to help us all the time. Anytime we're in trouble, we say, Jesus, help us. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that you are always there, that you always listen, that no matter what time of day or night it is, you will be right there to help us. Help us to always remember to ask you for help first and help us to always trust that you have the best in plans for us. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you in your name. Amen. Good morning. 
Our scripture reading for today is 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair or, and of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. It's our praise and prayer time. And I know that a number of you have praises. I have a praise this morning. Uh, we have a new year. The slate is clean. Looking for new things this year. Uh, dwelling on God more this year. And we just thank you, Lord, for those things. And in our prayers, each of you have people around you in your sphere that you know that need the prayers today. And we're not together today, but we're together in the spirit. And we invite you to Kneel where you are, bow your head as we seek the Lord this morning and give him thanks. Father in heaven, we come this morning praising you for a new year. We have seen so many things this past year, Lord, that can be discouraging, can be doubting, can be uh, sickness, not knowing what's going to happen. But Lord, as we come to you, we know, Lord, that you are the healer, you are the sustainer, you're the one who gives us things, Lord. And this week, as I read in the book Education, I read this statement. When once the gaze is fixed upon him, that's Jesus, life finds its center. When we focus on something else, the Christian becomes unbalanced. So this morning, we want to focus on you every day this year, Lord. Make this a priority. As we focus, we become balanced Christians. And this morning, Lord, you know the needs of our church. You know the people that are sick. You know the surrounding community which we're reaching out to, Lord. We also have a prayer for our Total Health Spokane team as they will be coming back as we try to reach out to neighbors and friends in this community. We just want you involved in everything this year, Lord. So we wanna focus on you and on what you have for us to do. And we wanna praise your name in all of this. This morning, we ask a special blessing for Pastor Joe as he uh, opens the word. As we receive, Lord, the word, we just ask that we may uh, concentrate on what he has to say this morning, that we will become stewards of you, that we will understand what you have for us this year. And we just want to praise your name and all these things in your name. Amen. I want to give greetings to everybody. And no matter how many times I do it, I will never grow used to speaking to an empty church. But this is just like old times. I guess it's not that long ago. But I think uh, the first 10 times maybe I preached at the Northview Church, 
It was an empty church at the beginning of COVID. And um, so, you know, we just finished the year 2020. And uh, how fitting. The Northview Church decides to go out with a bang and uh, start the new year with a bang. And we're just glad to do it that way. That, that works out just perfect. So appreciate everybody hanging tight. We've had a number of members who have uh, had COVID. And we're glad most of them are recovering, if not all well at this point. And um, so we just thought we would be, we want to take care of our members. And we want to be safe. And hope that everybody has had a, a good uh, change of routine and time to rest, to reflect, and to connect with family, whatever that looked like in a year like 2020 during these holidays that we just went through. And uh, I, I was blessed to have some time to slow down and to think and to reflect and to study. I listened to a number of messages uh, during the holidays. I listened to one that had a profound impact that I've been thinking about almost every day since. Last Sabbath, I listened to a message by Pastor Dwight Nelson that he gave earlier this month, and he read the quote from Ellen White in the book Evangelism, that uh, in the last days, uh, she saw the streams of light going to the world, God's people, as they went house to house with the scriptures open in their hands and praying people being converted, and uh, he made the observation it's a little hard to do that right now, to go house to house uh, during, at least in some places, the, the restrictions vary from location to location um, because of this uh, virus, and he says this thing has to open up for us to be able to do this, and I believe that this COVID thing uh, does have to lift, but the op observation um, it was very timely to think about the, the Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem. And when the city was surrounded with armies, and there was a time when the armies withdrew, and there was a little window for God's people to retreat. And um, when this thing lifts, I don't know how long the window will be, but that will be our opportunity to go out and to really pursue our mission like never before. And if this is true then that means that right now is our time to prepare and to pray and to deepen and to think and to train and to equip ourselves to do the mission that God has given to us, to share the message with the world. So as I think about the year 2020, that's what, that is what is on my mind. For me, my own heart, my soul, my family, my churches. It's time to be trained, it's time to deepen, it's time to connect, it's time to abide in Christ like never before, so that whatever windows of opportunity open up, we're ready to go. And however, they're lo uh, however long they're opened up, we don't waste those opportunities. You may think it's a little unique to start out the year with a, a sermon like this, but uh, if we're going to equip and train and be ready, where else to begin than with family? So I'm beginning a, a sermon series, Family Realigned. And you might wonder why I am starting out a sermon series like this, talking about the role of, of wife and of mother and of women in the church. But, you know, don't worry about that, ladies. When I, I'm going to preach to the men here before long, too. And when I preach to the men, I'm going to lay it on real thick. And they're going to feel very responsible, but I didn't want to start that way because I didn't want you to leave the room feeling like it was all their fault. So we got to share responsibility for everything, and we're going to read the scriptures. I've been uh, stirred up as I've been um, studying, and I'm excited to share this morning. But uh, we want to start out this year orienting our hearts to God and any of you that have ever listened to Pastor Pavel Goya before, you know what a profound blessing uh, this minister is having on our world church. He was a pastor when I was younger in Wisconsin, when I was with, in Wisconsin and then in Kentucky. And he works for the Ministerial uh, Association of the General Conference now. And the North Pacific Union um, is having Pavel Goya share with us this coming Tuesday and Wednesday. This is 10 days of prayer 
It is uh, organized by the North Pacific Union. And so I'm going to be emailing to the church some um, information, some links for you to tune in and to watch. It's going to be in the morning, but I'm sure you can watch it later in the day as well. And I really encourage you to listen to the messages this coming uh, Tuesday and Wednesday by Pavel Goya and this 10 days of prayer that we're going to have. There's some other speakers they have lined up as well that I'm not as familiar with, but I'm sure there'll be a blessing. And so this is time for us to come together. So it's, this isn't a great time right this week for us to c- bring the church together to pray in person together. We will be reconvening, reassembling, reopening the church next Sabbath, January 9, both, both first service and second service. And so I invite you to come next Sabbath. Joel Haywood will have a message with us, and he's going to be talking about the life of Saul, King Saul. A whole book of the Bible, almost, is about the life of King Saul, and there's many lessons there. But today we're beginning uh, with uh, defining women from India to Ethiopia, and woe be upon the young preacher that would ever attempt to define women. But perhaps you'll allow some scripture to add some defining uh, as we open the scriptures today and explore the stories that would challenge us. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a sociologist. I am a young pastor and a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the reason I'm preaching on the role of women and looking at these stories from Scripture, I can't think of too many other things that uh, would be more powerful uh, to me than to have our women in our church that embrace and are set free and live up to the role that God has called us to. So let's uh, pray as we open the scriptures this morning. I'm going to kneel here and ask God to guide us. Heavenly Father, we are seeking you on this second day of the new year, the first Sabbath. and We want our homes and We want our church and our relationships to be infused with your spirit. We want to be set free to be all that you have called us to be. Give us special insight and understanding. Me words uh, as we communicate the stories that you've given us through scripture and the promises. We pray in Jesus' name. Well, as we, as we uh, talk about the role of women, there are a few questions that we would have to ask ourselves. So we would need to know, uh, what is the woman's responsibility in the home? When should a wife stand up to her husband? Does she have the right, does a woman have the right to draw her own lines, her own boundaries? How much should she submit And how much should she preserve her own identity? Now, every religion in the world has to answer these questions on the role of women. And so as you go from religion to religion, they they offer different answers. And actually, every government and every society has to answer these as well. So a secular society cannot escape these questions either. One of the things that, one of the millions of reasons that attracts me to the beauty of the Christian faith is how it relates to women. And one of the things that attracts me to Jesus is how he places value in women. So another question to answer would be, how does, where does she belong in society? What does the Bible say about her role in business, and government, and these other functions of society? Maybe we'll have a little bit of time sometime to answer that. Uh, question three, what is her role as a friend? What kind of Influence does a woman have, and how should she use it? And what is a woman's place in church? And we're going to talk about a woman's role in church as well. The first three questions here, as I said, you don't have to be a Christian to have to face uh, this understanding of a, or to answer these questions of a woman's role. The Christian religion, one of the reasons I'm proud to be a Christian, and a follower of Jesus. Because the Christian religion has done more to improve the lot of women and the condition of women 
than any other religion in the world. So let me share a few windows from history. Maybe you're familiar with these, and maybe they are new to you. Wherever Christian missionaries went in the world, Christian missionaries were very strong in protesting the abuses against women and improving their, their condition. So when Hudson Taylor went to China and other uh, missionaries during the 19th century, they protested the things that were happening there. There was a very common practice there. I have a picture on the screen here called foot binding. When the girls, with their, their feet would be bound very tightly. And as these girls grew and as they matured, the foot would be deformed and reshaped around this so that women could have feet that would look like a high heel, except it's a bare foot, so that it would change the way that she walked to accentuate the female form more. This was uh, strongly protested because any fashion that deforms the body or subjugates women um, is an abuse. And women have been subjugated throughout history. But often they're subjugated in, in the name of things that seem attractive, like fashion. And there's even fashion in our own society that might seem attractive, but actually subjugates women. Um, when William Carey went to the Hindu villages in India, he saw it with his own eyes. He strongly protested, as did the other Christian missionaries. When they saw these young girls that were married to older Hindu men, and when the man died, when the husband died, this young widow would be placed upon his body when he was cremated, and she would be burned, with, burned alive with him. Uh, widow burning was outlawed in India in 1987. The voice of Christians was very strong in opposing this, I would say, barbaric practice. Um, but it is still, even though it is not practiced today in the religion, it, uh, there are still shrines that adorn the memory of those women who did that. Many of them did it willfully. No doubt some of them did it unwillfully. And when you go to other religions and other places, we look at the Muslim religion and Islam, and it says in the Quran, in Surah 434, men stand superior to women, but those whose perseverance ye fear, admonish them and remove them into bedchambers. This is talking about how a husband should treat a wife. Remove them into bedchambers and beat them. But if they submit to you, then do not seek a way against them. So this is in the Quran itself. So if you wonder why women are defined a certain way in the Islamic religion, it's in their most sacred text that a man should beat his wife and that she should submit to him. Now, the Christian religion and the scriptures also teach that a wife should submit to her husband. But it's a different kind of submission than in the Muslim religion. And it's a different kind of submission than what some may think. We're going to read the text about a wife submitting to a husband this morning, and we're going to understand, uh, at least partially, what that means. This is a picture of a woman from Saudi Arabia, Hussein al-Hathbo, and she was just sentenced this past Monday to almost six years in prison. Because of her role in Saudi Arabia, she's been in prison since 2018, she was one of the foremost uh, protesters and activists that were advocating for women to be able to drive in Saudi Arabia. It became legal for women to drive vehicles in Saudi Arabia in 2018, but uh, she has not enjoyed that because she has been in prison ever since and has another almost six years ahead of her based on the sentencing that happened earlier this week. And so whether you're a devout, to a religion or not, uh, women and societies everywhere are facing these questions about the role, the rightful role, role of a woman, her place in society. So we turn to scriptures. And the first story we're going to look at in the Bible 
is a story that you may not expect. Because this woman that we are about to look at in the Bible was not a Christian, was not a Jew, was a Gentile. There's no indication in Scripture that this woman prayed to the God of heaven, read the Scriptures, or had any fear of God. And so her actions were motivated by, the story doesn't tell us, but she had strength of character to stand up to society because she saw her role as a woman differently than how society around her saw it. And she protested, and she paid dearly for it. And so this woman, not being a Christian, not being a Jew, became an example, can be an example to all women living in any age, and is even an example to Christian women, Jews, and those who fear God. She demonstrated a strength of character. Her, the only story we have in the Bible about this woman is one of virtue and moral integrity. She was countercultural. She stood up and was different. She had a strong sense of self-worth, dignity, and honor that gave her the moral independence to stand up and to say no, to choose modesty and decency in an age of decadence, self-indulgence, and immorality. Society around this woman demanded that she violate her own boundaries for their own pleasure. Everybody in the room was waiting for her to appear in seductive clothes. The dance floor was cleared, the mood was high, alcohol flowed freely, just like it does in every bar and in every nightclub and every cultural all over the world, but this wasn't a bar and a nightclub, or maybe it was, but it was a royal palace of a king. Have you ever heard of Queen Vashti? Queen Vashti drew the line. She would not have her body objectified in the eyes of lustful, drunken men. They were waiting, and they expected her to come in and to tantalize their eyes with a suggestive dance. But she refused. She was not willing to gratify the eyes, their eyes with her feminine form, perhaps or perhaps not, half covered with glamorous clothes. She valued her own body, her own self, as something more sacred than a piece of prop property, a trophy belonging to the king. Society was pressuring her. The king's counselors, had something to say, pressuring her to flaunt her beauty for their pleasure. She refused to be defined that way, and she preserved, she protested, and she preserved her sacred honor. Now, Vashti was not just married to anybody. She was married to the most important man in the whole world, or the most powerful man in the whole world, King Ahasuerus who was the ruler of the ancient uh, empire of Persia and all of the 127 provinces that were stretching all the way from India to Ethiopia. And they had three uh, uh, capital cities. They rotated palaces. The story from Esther chapter 1 comes from the citadel of Susa, right there on the western border of Iran. And though Queen Vashti is a minor character in the narrative of Esther, you can turn to the book of Esther. It's in your Bibles. I'm not going to put all the words on the screen. Some of them I will. The book of Esther is right there in your Old Testament. And she, she is a minor character in this book that deserves major attention. The story is in Esther chapter 1. Some of the other capitals today have beautiful ruins. Persopolis is uh, quite famous down there. Many beautiful pictures. Susa, there are a few foundations still left. And that was the location of this palace of King Ahasuerus, where Queen Vashti was brought in. 
this story. I tell you, if Queen Vashti was living today, she would have some tough decisions to make. Because today, we're living in quite a decadent age ourselves. Where everything that you turn on and you watch is, is programming you and modeling and discipling you and teaching you how a woman can be flirtatious and sexual, her primary attributes in a society like ours. We're living in an age of immorality and of shameless depravity. Everything around in popular culture is designed to entice and entangle. And when we get swept in to the current, and we follow the fashion and the show and the display, and we post that which is all about our image on social media and what we look like, the Instagram culture, and some pretty dangerous uh, cultures. When we, get, we post something and we try to see how many likes we can get and how much affirmation we can get from people that are engaging, and that are liking, and we feel like this image that we're portraying to society of ourselves is um, all about me, but it's actually not. It's not all about me. It's all about corporations. It's all about money, and it's all about men that are still subjugating women. And the fashions and the display that make us feel so independent are actually enslaving. Queen Vashti was willing to, not willing to lose her honor and her virtue, and she was willing to sacrifice dearly to retain it. Then what should the women of God that are living in the last days do to preserve their own honor and their own sacred identity? Look at Esther chapter 1, where we have this story of Vashti. And we have, starting in verse 10, Starting in verse 10, Esther chapter 1, verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, there's the first problem. When there's intoxication, and there's lewdness, and there's licentiousness, the boundaries go down, and men see strange things. He commanded his seven eunuchs, who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown uh, in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials. For she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, brought by his eunuchs. Therefore the king was furious and his anger burned within him. They're calling her in to dance for this drunken crowd. She was very beautiful. By the way, many of the women of God throughout Scripture are described as beautiful. We're going to look at Sarah this morning. She's described as beautiful. There's nothing wrong with beauty. Beauty is good. God is the creator of beauty, which is why you want to use the power of beauty in the right direction and not in the wrong direction. So they bring her or they they want to bring her, she refuses. Then he gathers his counselors together, says, what in the world do we do? And they are extremely dismayed that the king's wife has refused this order. And so uh, Memucan, one of the counselors, spoke up in verse 16. Memucan answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also the princes and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. She is threatening the role of women all the way from India to Ethiopia. We cannot have this. This is not just about your family. This is about all of our families. She is going to cause all women to be rebellious. Verse 17, for the queen's behavior will become known to all the women so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report. King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. 
And so this now became an example and a prototype of all the families from India to Ethiopia and all the land of of the Persian Empire. And they said, we cannot let Queen Vashti get away with saying no to her husband and standing up to him like this because then all men, every, all women everywhere will become independent. And so they counseled together and decided that Queen Vashti could never come in before the king again. And so he, she was to never appear. In ancient cultures like that, it would have been normal for her to be killed. But her life was uh, preserved, and she was banished, expelled from the court of the king. She sacrificed dearly. She lost almost everything. But there was one thing she was not willing to lose, and that was her own purity. And for the sake of her own purity, this secular woman stood up and was willing to lose all else. We need more Vashtis today. The world is looking for women who will think and who will value themselves and their own integrity, their sacredness, their virtue, and who will stand up against the, the, the stream of culture. Secular women today are looking for these kind of women. The way that a woman conducts herself today can draw or it can repel. Vashti was a subversive woman. She stood up against the king, and she refused to obey. We need subversive women today, too. And if you're a woman whose nature is subversive, it's okay to be subversive as long as you restrain yourself and you channel your subversive energies in the right direction. Whenever you speak, and you dress, and you act, and your mannerisms, and you conduct yourself in a modest way, you're rebelling against the culture of this world. This world is constantly telling us we have to be flirtatious and sexual. We have to entice and entangle. But to be a woman of virtue is to live a life of protest and maybe even activism. And maybe the girls growing up in our church have forgotten this. Because when they reach the age where they want to be subversive and to express their own independence and their own freedoms, let me tell you something. It doesn't take any bravery for a child or a teenager to rebel against parents. Children all over the world do that. It doesn't, you're not a hero by rebelling against the standards of the church. What takes bravery in this world is to stand up against the culture of the world. And so actually, if we were to stop and think about our identity and our, our history, we would realize that the standards presented and taught in scriptures and promoted by the church are themselves subversive to the world. That you would be different that you would be your own person, and that you would be who God has called you to be. Somebody who's willing to live in modesty and simplicity because there's nothing more beautiful and more attractive than that. So they, these counselors became very concerned because Vashti was going to unravel the relationship between husbands and wives all over the country. And so I want to talk about this marriage relationship between husband and wife. You see, Vashti was not willing to go along, even though she was married to the most powerful man in the world, was not willing, she was not just simply on standby to concede to whatever the whims of her husband were. She was not available at all times for all purposes. So when should, if ever, a wife stand up to her husband, does, like Vashti did? Does she have the right to draw her own lines? How much should she submit and how much should she preserve her own identity? Six and a half years ago, 
Ruthie and I were married in the Chattanooga First Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the pastor who did our wedding was Pastor Don McIntosh, whose ministry these days is at Weimar in California. And as we were standing there, and he was delivering the homily at my wedding and that of Ruthie's, uh, in the middle of his sermon, sermon at whatever you want to call the short homily in this uh, wedding, he read a, a short, at least part of a paragraph from Adventist Home about the wife. And this short sentence or two that he read, it's on page 116 of Adventist Home, which says, God has not given her the wife, or he has given her the wife, a conscience which she cannot violate with impunity. Her individuality cannot be merged into that of her husband, for she is the purchase of Christ. And Pastor McIntosh uh, looked at the audience and was beginning to ex uh, ready to explain to the audience the importance of the wife retaining her own identity and an individuality even after she was married. But then he stopped himself and he said, well, for those of us that know Ruthie, we know that she's not going to have any problem with that. And so the past six and a half years have proved Pastor Don's uh, prophecy to be correct and that Ruthie has not really had too much problem retaining her own individuality and independence because no matter how hard I try or no matter how many times I try, I have never been able to secure the complete and absolute submission of my wife. As I read from the Bible, and we're going to read this verse about submission, but first of all, we should check out what the rest of this paragraph in Adventist Home says. Uh, this counsel written by Ellen White, I read the last part of the paragraph already. But the first sentence is, this is Adventist Home, page 116. Go read it. Pull out this book again. Read what it says, the context, everything else. God requires that the wife shall keep the fear and glory of the Lord ever before her. Entire submission is to be made only to the Lord Jesus Christ, who has purchased her as his own child by the infinite price of his life. Entire submission is only, even for women, to be made to Jesus Christ and to no other person. The next paragraph says, same page of Adventist Home, page 116, when husbands require the complete subjection of their wives, declaring that women have no voice or will in the family, but must render entire submission, they place their wives in a position contrary to the Scripture. It might be in line with other religions and other sacred texts, such as the Quran, but not the Bible. It's a misinterpretation of the Bible. In interpreting the Scripture in this way, they do violence to the design of the marriage institution. This interpretation is made simply that they may exercise arbitrary rule, which is not their prerogative. It is not the prerogative of the husband to exercise arbitrary rule. And so, in 2015, January of 2015, uh, we moved to Berrien Springs, Michigan, and I became the associate pastor of the Village Seventh-day Adventist Church. And at the beginning of that year, Pastor Ron Kelly began a sermon series called Family SOS. And in this sermon series, he went through the various aspects and the roles of family and those relationships and those priorities. And in February, he preached a sermon called She Won't Back Up and She Won't Back Down. And in the middle of that sermon, Pastor Kelly said that the wife must submit, but must not surrender. And little did I know that six years later, I would still hear my wife quoting this sermon. I will submit, but I won't surrender. I might be exaggerating only a little bit to say that I've heard that quoted many, many, many times since. I will submit, 
but not surrender. It's actually biblical, and as we go to the Scripture, we are going to go to these verses that speak about a woman submitting to her husband and to understand uh, the nature of that submission. We read from 1 Peter 3 in our Scripture reading. And it says, um, 1 Peter 3, starting in the first verse, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. The wife is to submit to her husband. Uh, That even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by their conduct, the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Even wives of unbelieving husbands are supposed to submit to their unbelieving husbands. But it is a conditional submission. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. And this is the great trap of women, is to make their identity, their value, wrapped around their image and their dress and their apparel. And the scripture warns about that many times. I don't have a lot of time to unpack Uh, dress standards in this in this message but I have done some studying recently and um, if any of you want to text me or message me I can send you to some chapters some really good chapters in the spirit of prophecy here's the problem with Seventh-day Adventists our standards have slipped so much you know when I was a kid that there would be a debate on some of these things in an Adventist church on where is the line when it comes to dress standards But now we have gone so far down the road that we're not debating the line anymore, where it is. We're just debating even if there is a line. We will just dress how everybody else dresses. We will just listen to the same music that everyone else listens to. We will just do what everybody else does. I kind of miss the days when we debated where the line is because now people are wondering if there even is a line. So, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's clear again and again and again that Christian women are to dress differently than women of the world. And if you've lost that, you've lost a lot. But it says, uh, continuing in verse 4 to 6, rather, rather than the outward apparel, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted uh, in God also uh, adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid of any terror. So the Bible gives an example of a wife who is the, the preeminent example of the Christian wife and mother and woman. Her name is Sarah. We go to the story of Sarah to find out what it looks like when a wife submits to her husband. In the narrative of Genesis, if you're to study it systematically, you can make many parallels to to realize that Abraham and Sarah were the next or the second Adam and Eve. What Adam and Eve lost, God was trying to restore to Abraham and Sarah and to their descendants by faith. And thus we are children of Abraham and Sarah today if we are people of faith. So Abraham is not only the father of the faithful, Sarah is the mother of the faithful. And so if you go anywhere in Scripture to find an example for women, this would have to be certainly somewhere near the top of the list. And there are many chapters describing this relationship between Sarah and Abraham to make very clear Uh, how they related to each other. The story starts out in chapter 12 of Genesis. God called Abraham, his name was Abram at that time, out of Ur of the Chaldees. But in Genesis chapter 12, it specifically names Sarah, that she followed him, and that she went with him. Abraham was not following Sarah. Sarah was following Abraham. Abraham moved. Sarah followed her. Abraham went from Haran to Canaan to Shechem to Egypt, back to Canaan to Gerar, and back to Canaan. And Sarah followed him every single time. Sarah obeyed Abraham, followed him, 
and submitted to him. But it was not an entire and absolute submission. Because there were times when Abraham also needed her leadership. Because though the man was the primary leader, the woman's a leader as well. And there are times and there are stories in this marriage relationship where Sarah led as well, and Abraham had to follow Sarah. Have you noticed that before? In Genesis 21, this is quite a ways down in this story of Abraham and Sarah towards the end. And things had become uh, quite hostile in their home because of this Egyptian bondwoman, Hagar, that Abraham took so that he could have a son. That son's name was Ishmael. Once Isaac was born, there was major problems and jealousies in the marriage. And Sarah was jealous. There is a godly jealousy put into the heart of the woman. And she responded because of this jealousy within her. In Genesis 21, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian. Genesis 21, starting in verse 9. The one whom she had borne to Abraham, he was scoffing. Ishmael was scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. Meaning, Abraham didn't want to do it. He wasn't on the same track with his wife. But God came down to, to resolve this marital conflict. And it's not going to end in the husband's favor. In Genesis 21, verse 12, it says, God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your uh, bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Now men, how would you like that? If God came down in a dream and told you, whatever your wife says to you, do it. And that's exactly what he told Abraham. And so Abraham needed Sarah's feedback and leadership. And he needed to su submit to what Sarah was asking for in this case. So that we are beyond doubt, God explicitly told Abraham that's what he needed to do. Now, a woman needs to keep her jealousy in proper bounds as well. This jealousy of Sarah was affirmed by God. There are other stories in Scripture where the jealousy of the wife is not affirmed by God. You can think of the story, we won't turn there, but you can think of the story of King David and Michael. Michael, the daughter of King Saul. And Michael was jealous when she saw David out dancing when the sanctuary was, was being set up and moved. And David was rejoicing. It wasn't a seductive, sexual kind of dance. It was one that was appropriate and worshipful. And she was jealous. And God said, no, no. David is right. And she had no children. So the woman has to also keep her own jealousies or feelings in check and to use them properly. And thus there is a balance and there is a give and take in marriage. Ah, I have one more story in Scripture as I, as I end here. You know, in some conservative circles, I've heard some very false theology at times. You know, I, I, I heard it said when I was a kid that God communicates to the angel. The angel communicates to the prophet. The prophet communicates to the husband, and the husband communicates to the wife. That's messed up. And it's not scriptural. Because God has created the woman to commune with himself as well. The woman connects with God just as much as the husband does. And oftentimes more. And thus we have stories in the Bible when angels would come to communicate messages to families. 
Sometimes it wasn't to the man of the family. Sometimes it was to the woman of the family, such as in the story of Manoah and his wife, the parents of Samson, in Judges 13, starting in verse 8. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. You see, an angel had appeared to his wife already and said, you're going to have a child. And already given some instructions on how to raise this child. Meanwhile, the husband, his name is Manoah, he's saying, please send the angel again. I want to know how to raise this child. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came to the woman again. Oh. Manoah wanted the angel to come to him. He came back to his wife as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. I don't know if the angel was waiting until Manoah was away. And said, so I'm going to wait till he's away and I'm going to appear. I don't know. All I know is God was communicating directly to this wife and to this mother. And she was communicating to her husband. That's as far as I have on this. So she, and then if you read the rest in, in Judges 13, you can go read this chapter for yourself. Finally, when Manoah got to meet with the angel, he asked the angel, how shall we raise this child? And basically the angel says, I already told your wife, just listen to her. And so, um, God wants to communicate with each person and each individual. You know, this world, if we get swept into, this, swept into the stream of the culture, it's wanting to turn us into animals. It's all about appearance. It's all about image. It's all about this or about that. Vashti wouldn't have any of that. Women of God shouldn't have any of that either. God has created a very high position for his sons and his daughters who he has created in his own image. When we look at this further next time, we're going to look at some New Testament stories and the woman's influence and her role in church and some other questions like that. But I'm praying now that God will set us free, that we will be brave, that we will be oriented in our hearts to be different. I don't care what's happening around us. I don't care what kind of, of messages are, are throbbing in our ears, in our minds through through the music, through the, the culture around us, the messages that are permeating our mind, we stand up against all that, and we be who God has called us to be. The act, to the person, to the activities, to the role, to the voice, all of it. My message next time is going to be her place, her power, and her presence. And we're going to unpack it a little further. But I want to ask you this morning, I want to ask you about this. What do you think? By the way, you can, uh, you can give me feedback. You can, uh, most of you have my phone number. You can text. You can talk to me. You can redirect me. You can challenge me. Whatever you want. But do you want to be a Vashti? Do you want to stand up and be different? To put your value, and to protect your value, your sacred honor, your, prote your integrity that God has created you. Even though she lost everything, she took a stand. Do you want to be a Vashti? Are there things you need to say no to? I am not going on to that dance floor. I am not doing that. I encourage you to connect with God and to have the backbone and the nerve to stand up in the world that we're living and to be different and to be a daughter of God. If you're married, are you willing to be a Sarah? Are you willing to follow your husband from place to place? Are you willing to submit and to obey? But not total and absolute submission. Are you willing to stand up and to be a leader when you need to be a leader and at times to lead him? Because God has put you in that place to challenge and to exhort and to encourage your husband, your children, and everybody that you have influence with. That's what we want in our church and that's what we want in our homes. Let's sing this uh, closing hymn together, and then we will have a closing prayer at the end. It's hymn...
493. And it's about the woman at the well. Fill my cup, Lord. Let's sing this together. I invite you, and then we will have the invocation afterwards. I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, draw from my wealth that never ran dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Heavenly Father, today we give you our lives, ourselves, everything that we have, everything that we are. Lord, the traps, the, the roadblocks, the stumbling blocks, please take those out of the way. We want to let go of the things that ensnare us and entrap us. And we want to be who you've called us to be. And the full person that you have created is a role for us to fill. And I pray that this church can become strong, that we would have our voice, and that we would be about our mission, that you would keep us safe and that you would keep us healthy until we assemble next Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us online. Send me a message and connect. Since I can't see your face today, we will have prayer meeting online this week and beginning the 10 days of prayer with the North Pacific Union. And uh, next Sabbath, we will be here in person at the church, both services, again, 8.30 and 11 a.m. and Sabbath school in person, and we look forward to seeing you then. God bless.